About 12 years ago, I remember walking through the streets of my college campus in the dead of night. It was Ramadan and I had just converted to Islam. I was so excited to be joining my fellow Muslim students for suhoor, the pre-dawn meal just before fasting. I remember feeling surprised at myself for choosing to forego my precious sleep and for walking alone at night. But all I felt was elated, my heart swelling as it does for so many of us during Ramadan with faith and love in my community. Well, earlier this year, a young Muslim woman in Virginia did something similar. She went out for suhoor with her friends after attending Ramadan prayers at her mosque. Only in her case, she didn't reach her destination. She was kidnapped, assaulted, and murdered by someone she did not know. Her name was Nabra Hassanin. And I remember feeling that could have been me, that could have been any of us. On the next day, as we learned of the events that had unfolded, my husband and I drove to the Adams Center to be with her community. I remember seeing the look on the face of Imam Majid, her Imam, my Imam, and I had never seen him look so broken. I watched him hold together his own grief while I saw him do what I've seen him do so many times before, be the leader that his community needed. Community members came to him one after the other with crises of faith, questions about mosque security, and so much more. And on that day and the days that followed, Imam Majid played every role imaginable. He was a pastoral care provider to Nabra's family, to her young friends, and to others in the mosque community. He was a liaison to law enforcement, and he was a national spokesperson on a tragedy that affected us all and for which we needed that leadership. In this situation and so many more, he plays this multifaceted role as a national and an international leader, all the while still being our Imam. We have come to rely on Imam Majid so much because he has a way of always demonstrating kindness with great sincerity while never wavering on matters of justice. He consistently uses his privilege to advocate for and empower others. On many occasions, he is the sole male scholar in a crowd of female scholars calling for justice on issues of gender-based violence. He is consistently on the right side of history. He has mastered the art of never speaking an unkind word, but also challenging anything that is cause for concern. I've seen this in his dealings with White House officials, religious scholars, and community members. And to give you a trivial example of this, on occasions when he is mildly upset with someone, he smiles at them and says with a hint of irony, may Allah bless you. <laughs> Imam Majid, in all sincerity, may God bless you. It is my honor to join in awarding you such a well-deserved recognition. That's what bless you meant. <laughs> I knew that before. <laughs> Imam Majid, where do we start in expressing our gratitude to you? So many people express joy and happiness when they found out that you're winning the award tonight. And I hope that I can convey uh, with Maggie all the sentiments that we all collectively share. It wouldn't be quite accurate to say that Imam Majid is tireless in his commitment to the community because when we see him, he's usually tired. <laughs> but that's because a typical day in the life of Imam Majid might include any or all of the following tasks. Giving a talk after Friday morning prayers, after morning prayers at the mosque, helping get his five daughters ready for school, counseling newlyweds, officiating a marriage, meeting with interfaith leaders, giving an interview to the press, advising government officials while speaking at a think tank, talking to concerned parents, visiting a, visiting, visiting a congregant at the hospital or a food bank, teaching a class on Imam Ghazali, leading a conference call to resolve the latest community dispute, answering a call from a foreign leader and planning an international peacemaking mission. And by then, it's almost lunchtime. 
It's true. Because it's because you care so deeply about the hearts and souls in our community, about our collective mental and social well-being, that you give your time so selflessly, your best counsel so genuinely, and your compassion so generously. Every day in so many ways, Imam Majid shows us what true leadership in service looks like. And in doing so, he walks in the footsteps of his distinguished father, the former Grand Mufti of Sudan. <laughs> Dr. Ingrid Matson, the former president of Islam, describes him as a walking example of the prophetic model through his compassion for all of us and for showing us what courage and principle leadership rooted in faith looks like. We've all seen Imam Majid use his social capital for what's right when a few others would. Whether it is to stand up for abused women in America or for Christians being persecuted in Muslim majority countries, whether it's supporting recovering addicts who need immediate help and someone to talk to, or standing up as an ally to the Jewish community on the national stage. Imam Majid is claimed by many, his family, the Adams community, the American Muslim community, the interfaith community, and the global community. He's always in demand, and yet, he always somehow makes himself available when and where he's needed. We're also blessed at the foundation, Imam Majid, to be beneficiaries of your love and guidance. It'll never be forgotten that uh, Imam Majid led the funeral service and burial of Ibrahim al-Hibri a decade ago. And over the years, he's continued to support this family and foundation. On a personal level, I just have to say, Imam Majid, you're the real deal. <laughs> you never stop being an Imam, whether it's 5 in the morning or 11 at night. Whether you're in a personal or professional gathering, you're constantly and consistently a generous and humble human being. You give the warmth, respect, and careful attention to someone you've just met, as you do when meeting a head of state. You put yourself through so much hardship for the ease of others and expect nothing in return. And it was an honor doing Hajj with you this year. And it was really hard not to tell you about this award throughout the time. <laughs> so I'm honored along with our chairman, Fuad Al-Hibri and Maggie to present the Peace Education Award to you this year. Please join me in welcoming. In the name of God, the source of mercy, the giver of mercy. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I feel always kind of uh, not at ease when I've been given an award. You know, um, when you give the Imam a microphone on Thursday night, and your tomorrow is Friday, he might practice his sermon on you. <laughs> and therefore, I was told that somebody gonna time me up. That's why I wrote my remarks, so to be disciplined tonight. First, I would like to thank Farhan and Maggie for this generous introduction. Appreciate both of you for the work that you do and the service that you provide for the community as well. I thank God Almighty for my presence with you tonight at this event, which is an annual event organized by the Hebrew Foundation to recognize the work of people who work to advance peace in our community. This foundation has supported many people, made a lot of difference in many people's life. 
And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, telling us, the person have not shown gratitude to people, have not shown gratitude to God Almighty. Therefore, I would like to thank the family of Al-Hibri for supporting great work of many people in the United States and abroad. Also, I feel humbled because this award is not about me. It is about those who have shaped me, those who taught me and guided me to serve others. And that begins with my parents. I did not live with my mother for a long time. She passed away when I was four years old. But my father, <clears throat> kept telling me about her as I grew up, about how generous, loving, and caring she was toward others. My stepmothers then taught us about love and compassion, and she raised us, she raised me and my other four siblings as her own children. My father was my first teacher. He told me how to love the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He always repeated the saying of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Be conscious of God wherever you may be. And reconcile your bad deeds with good deeds. Ask God for forgiveness. And treat humanity the way they deserve to be treated with dignity and honor. My father used to apply this saying in his everyday life to remind us that there's a three relationship that we need to be aware of. Relationship with God, relationship with oneself, and the relationship with humanity. With this foundation, he worked the foundation and principle, he worked to build a culture of peace. And all of us we should think about building culture of peace based on those foundations. My father, God bless his soul, he used to deliver food to hungry children and the students of the schools in rural areas in Sudan, and he would make sure being delivered because he goes himself to deliver the food. He used to buy big quantity of fabric and go to the area where people don't have enough clothing, and he would ask people to sew the clothes for them. But I will never forget his advice to me, many advice he gave, me, he gave me, but one of them, that we were about to cross the street in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where I was there also for treatment before he came to the United States. My father squeezed my hand with his gentle hand, it's always perfumed. When he shake your hand, you can smell your hand beautiful perfume. And he said to me, as he looked at me, right there, and he said, oh son, I want to give you an advice. If you choose to live anywhere, if you choose to live anywhere, talking about other than Sudan, make sure wherever you live, you should leave a legacy and good impact on people around you. A legacy that one day you'll be happy with it when you meet your Lord. And then he said, and this impact and legacy, it will not be possible without serving, serving others. And serving 
others requires that giving of much of yourself. Later, when he came to United States for treatment, we are in a small Mazda car, driving him from the doctor appointment back home. He looked at me and said, son, Ya Ibni, my son, do you remember the advice I gave you when you were in Jeddah? I said, yes. He said, repeat it to me. Then I repeated to him. As if it was giving me a, a signal that he's about to leave this world. A few months after that, he died in 1990. So, in repeating and reflecting on my father's advice, I tried my best to live up to the model and example of serving others that he put before me. I know I have a lot of shortcoming and I need to do more and to do better. I have to know that this idea of giving much of yourself is not only about you, but about collective we. Here I can see, I can see how much my family have given of, their, of themselves to help me do this work. My dear wife, Amara, and my <laughs> daughters, Mona, Amani, and Salima and Rahman Rahima, and my great in-laws. I'm not saying that just to be nice. <laughs> they are very good in-laws. for their patience and sacrifice for me to do what I do now. Without them, I would not have been able to serve. Also, I would like to thank my community and the people around me for giving me the chance to serve them. Imam al-Ghazali said, which is the, what Farhan said that my brother Noor told him, your love for others and serving them it is an honor bestowed upon you from God Almighty. For when you love people and care about them, this is an opportunity was given to you to bring the best of you. And therefore, the person who received that is a person who brings that best of you, and you need to thank them for the opportunity. Honorable guest, peace is built on relationships with others, period. Relationship with others. And to see ourselves in others. For the word in Arabic, akhir, which means the other, it includes the word akh, which means brother. And the word brother in English include the word other. You might say, what is the word sister? All the problems come from the brothers. <laughs> Therefore, I've learned from the saying of the prophet, which is a guide to all the work that I do, when he said the best of people is the one who is more beneficial to others. And I learned from him that the person of faith is a person that humanity feels safe in his or her presence. It's a prophet Muhammad who said, the best among you are those who are the best in their family. There are values, those are the values that we can share as universal values with all people of faith, 
or people of no faith. Every religion, every philosophy have the same foundation. Those we call universal human values. And Islam is a religion that recognizes the universal wisdom. And with the relationship with others, as I said earlier, by treating them with dignity and honor, I know in this gathering today, there's so many people who deserve this award. Because all of us who strive together to create a community of love and peace. And because I know also in this gathering we have people of other faith, I would like to share that universal wisdom. You know, the, I heard from a friend of mine, a rabbi, about Rabbi Hilal. When he was asked to teach the entire Torah while standing on one foot, Rabbi Hilal replied, what is hateful to you, don't do you to your neighbor. This is the whole Torah, while the rest is a commentary. And by the way, when I heard this first time, I thought of an idea to shorten Taraweeh. <laughs> Night prayer and khutbah al Jum'ah for the sake of having peace in our community. I'm not going to mention it today. Um, also, you heard many times the saying of Jesus, peace be upon him, who said, blessed are the peacemakers. And Jesus said, peacemakers, not, not peacekeeper, is proactive to seek to make peace with others. Is Muhammad, Muhammad is, with his, the, with, Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi said, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. <laughs> I would like to say that spreading the culture of peace is an obligation. It's an obligation upon every human being. For the sake of the children who die every day because of war or because they've been neglected not being provided food or health care. I saw the vulnerability and the fear in the eyes of the girls who were released from Boko Haram in Nigeria. I interviewed them personally. I saw in them my daughters. <clears throat> and I prayed for those girls from the bottom of my heart. And I prayed with them. And I cried with them. <clears throat> or for the people of Central African Republic, where the violence has shattered the peace in that community and created fear and mistrust. Or for the women in Darfur, in the 80s, there was a drought in Sudan. And I was asked to join group of people who provided food for people who left the west of Sudan and marched toward Khartoum. And some of them have died in a way. The one I was excited, I was a young man, and I went to the people in the camp and said, tell me what to do. They said, take this meal and go there to that group of people and provide the meal there. I took the meal and from this tent, I've seen a person holding a child on their hand, but I didn't realize it was a male or female. The person was so starved, you can see just the, the skeleton. I walked toward her, toward the person, and it was a lady. And I cannot forget how she looked at me. Because I came an excited young man and said, oh, we're here to help you. We're here to give food. I brought food. And she looked at me with eyes that no tears, nothing, and eyes are so deep. And she looked at me and said, son, 
I think you guys, you guys, you are late. You are late. The child in my hand have died. She called him a dead baby. It shattered me. It haunted me all my life. And therefore, if you lose the sleep of serving others, you still come to warm bed, an air-conditioned home. And you get to drive a car that you can adjust the heat on it. And you can open your refrigerator and see all type of cheese that you cannot even name. <laughs> Until today, this is with me. Lastly, I want to say we need to do work, continue to work for peace because of so many people. People here in this beautiful country. There are about six million people in the United States. They don't have enough food. Six million in the United States. Many children, they go hungry in the summertime because they used to eat lunch in the school. My dear brothers and sisters, I would like to, to say to myself first, we have to have this mission of creating peace begin with ourselves. This in our family. I joined an organization that fight domestic violence and abuse against women because I believe that Family is a cornerstone of society. It has to be also in our neighborhood. That's why my friend, Pastor Bob Roberts and myself, we have decided to start a project to promote peaceful neighborhood. And we call it my neighbor keeper. That based on the concept of loving thy neighbor, which is a concept in most of religion that promote this loving and honoring, honoring our neighbor. In every time that I, as an imam, visit a sick person, or officiate a marriage, or hold a new baby, or resolve a conflict between husband and wife, or child, I see in their vulnerability my vulnerability. I see in their hope my hope. And that applies in every human being, regardless of their faith, regardless of religion, regardless of the ethnicity. We have to work together to promote love and care in community and society because at the end of the day, we are one race, human race. We are one family. We are all the children of Adam and Eve. May God bless Al Hebrew Foundation May God bless the family of Al Hibri. May God bless the staff, the board, and may God bless all of you for all the work you do. With tremendous love and respect, we say assalamu alaikum. <laughs>